Roger here with Robert and Martin, CEO and CTO of Perceptor Labs. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So, exactly what is Perceptor Labs? And maybe you can tell us how you got to starting up a company. Yeah, of course. So, me and Martin met the first day at uh, university. And uh, ever since then, we kind of, throughout the entire university, we did projects together. Um, a lot of garage projects. Uh, I have a little lab in my garage, which we used to go to and play around with uh, electronics. Um, and uh, we, during the last semester of university, uh, we kind of figured, hey, why not start up a company? We had a, a, an idea of uh, kind of how to make uh, machine learning easier and more efficient. Um, so we said, we just do everything around that. Um, and that's kind of how it all started. Uh, and the platform, which is um, now recently in uh, beta, um, actually, like two days ago. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> pretty recent. It. Very recent. <laughs> um, so the platform itself is, uh, it acts like an abstraction to machine learning, where you can, instead of coding everything, you can drag and drop in different components. Uh, and these components act as kind of templates uh, to uh, different layers in a machine learning model. So what we strive to do is uh, we give the abstraction layer with just seeing a nice view of how the model looks. But then you can even, and then you can also deep dive into every component and you can custom code it. So in that way, it's very much like an IDE for machine learning. Uh, and on top of this, we provide a bunch of boilerplate plate visualizations. Um, so as you're building the model and as you're training it, you get instant feedback on how it's going. So you can much easier debug it and see kind of where, where does it not match up. So you've got kind of a visual tool for AI. How did you come up with the idea? Uh, it's a pretty fun story, or it's a story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it started in 2016. I was in studying in Spain, and Robert was still in Stockholm. And a friend of mine mentioned a hackathon called Junction, like the Europe's largest hackathon in Helsinki. Uh, so I asked Robert if he wanted to participate since we like doing projects together. Uh, so we flew out to Helsinki, and we were gonna do like a competition there where we use European Space Agency satellite uh, image data uh, to track fish swarms. And we realized pretty quickly that this is gonna take longer time than two, three days to build it out and train it and everything. Uh, so we actually ended up building a VR game instead. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but yeah, that's how we come up with the idea of we want to have an easier way of working with machine learning. Um, and we started thinking about this visual, graphical user interface. And yeah, from there we started to working it on weekends at Robert's place. I think our first idea was to build it in VR so you can in 3D see the yeah. neurons. That was probably our first idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It took a turn from there. <laughs> yeah. But th but that sounds interesting in that it sounds like in, in a way you're trying to abstract away from the nuts and bolts of doing it to really thinking about the actual model yes. that you're trying to build. So, um, so th it sounds like VR and stuff actually does make sense in that from some some perspective. So where do you th see things going in the machine learning space? So I think we can look at, especially now, TensorFlow and PyTorch. Um, so TensorFlow has always been uh, a very popular f framework, um, and especially now in, in production and everything. Then Keras um, started to incorporate, or TensorFlow started to incorporate Keras more and more because of the high level API it is, and people really showed that they want to use this. Uh, the same thing with PyTorch when it came out. People started using PyTorch more and more because it's just so much simpler to use. It's more Pythonic. Um, so we can really see now with TensorFlow 2.0 that they try to bridge the gap between like researchers and beginners. So you can use a high-level API but still have the flexibility. And that's the way we see it as well. That's where it should go. Yeah. So, so for your framework, how does it differ from what else is out there, As, aside from it being visual? <laughs> well, the visual is a very big part of it. Um, so with the other frameworks, if we compare to like TensorFlow and uh, um, Scikit-Learn and PyTorch, 
we, we don't really compete against them in any way. Uh, we're rather building on top of them. And uh, we're wrapping around, so every of our components contains their code. Um, what we're doing is providing a lot of visualizations and this abstraction layer uh, to make it just simpler to get started, easier to iterate models, but still allowing you to actually deep dive in. Um, so that's how we differ from, or how we compare to TensorFlow and so on. Uh, then what we're really striving to do is not to lock anyone in. Uh, we don't want the components or anything to be hard-coded, so we want you to be able to build anything you would be able to build in just raw code, just with some extra bonuses. Do you think you're really working on like democratizing access? Is, is this easier for everyone to do it, or is it making people already kind of know what they're doing uh, more productive? So democratizing AI was our first slogan, and it was has been everyone's slogan. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it seems like nowadays. Um, so, in a way, it does make the barrier of entry smaller, right? You, you get visual feedback and you can very easily understand what's happening, even though you don't are too familiar with the math to start with. Um, so that way, yeah, it makes it easier. Um, it is a big boon, though, for those who actually already know. Uh, and we get a lot of good feedback from that, where just easily start iterating a model and actually seeing what's happening inside the model and the debugging and everything. You don't have, I mean, that's possible in another like TensorFlow framework also, but you don't really want to sit and code all of that every time you build a model. Um, so that's, yeah. yeah. So you really think both, you're really trying to cover both? Uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely not trying to cover like what AutoML are doing. So, because that's, that's in why we're really like that's really democratizing AI, but it's still I don't know how good it is to not have a clue what's going on behind the scenes either. So um, yeah, no, I, I, I th there's a pretty I think there's a pretty big difference between what AutoML is trying to do. Yeah, I think AutoML is good when the problem is well understood by a lot of people. Yes. And it sounds like what you're trying to do is when you've got a particular problem to solve. Yeah, yeah exactly. And so getting coding out of the way of iterating is a big boon to getting to the end state. Yes, that, that so we actually started building it for ourselves to do machine learning research and come up with novel architectures. So like the idea was, look at the archive expect paper, see the drawing that they made of the network, and just being able to draw out the building blocks and you have it there. Mm -hmm. A complex model built in a few seconds. So one of the things we keep hearing about, particularly with neural networks, is they're hard to explain what's going on, and mm -hmm. uh, repro well, reproducibility is a whole different problem. But do you think with the visual model, you're getting better explainability? Yeah, definitely. I do think that um, being able to actually look into what each component does with a visual interface does help a lot to, at least at some level, understand intuitively what kind of what does it do. Um, mm -hmm. So given that, I, when I when I build a model, I have mm -hmm. no idea what just happened. <laughs> sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. I don't have the time to like go into it. Do you have any examples where you actually did some work and you're like, wow, I actually know why it made this mistake or why it was really good at predicting this thing? Yeah, we did this fun thing at um, uh, Red Hat Summit now in, in May at Bo in Boston, where we, with Red Hat, built out a Twitter bot uh, which allowed you to, if you upload a picture of Twitter and mention um, the bot's name, it will give you a classification if it's a red hat in the picture or not. Uh, so when we built out that model, we had like five days or something on us, yeah. and we used <laughs> our platform for that. And it was very good because we could see very quickly, like there are some ways you can look. So if the gradient, for example, is flat in a convolutional layer, you know that it's not learning. So we could use that kind of things in the platform. Oh, so you, you show the gradients? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can like see that very that's, quickly. That's cool. So you can quick uh, pause or stop the training, change something. It's, it's a way of fast iterate through model architectures. So in a way, you're able to do some of your feature engineering yeah. mm -hmm. within the, the layers of the model. Interesting. That sounds pretty cool. Given that we're, we're at now with PyTorch and TensorFlow, we're at the TensorFlow World uh, Conference, where do you see things evolving? I think it's much like Martin said, we're going to go more and more towards this abstraction layer. No one really wants to sit in deep, deep, deep unless they have to. So if you can abstract that away, 
that's a big plus. Yeah, and for the modeling part, we can see more and more um, APIs coming out that like make it easier to interpret models and all these visualization tools. So we're going to work a lot on making it even making it even more. <laughs> visual and, and uh, making it easier to understand what's happening. Yeah, there's a lot of things, cool things you can do with debugging and trying to figure out exactly what's happening inside this black box. It is. It does seem like a black box when you're, uh, <laughs> when you're using it. Okay. Well, thank you both for your time. Thank, thank you, you very much.